Before we uh, go fully into our webinar, I want to launch a quick poll question that I'm going to have up for folks. And I'll just have this poll question up while we um, are doing our my uh, housekeeping slides here. Uh, the poll question basically, what we want to know is if you all can indicate what your current knowledge is on today's topic. So you all should see that poll question pop up uh, for you in a couple of seconds. And while I'm doing my housekeeping here, if you could just complete that poll question, that would be much appreciated. Again, welcome to today's web event. My name is William Moore with OJJDP's Intac. I want to welcome our audience that's still joining now to the Introduction to Life's Legal Life Skills, an educational initiative to increase youth's knowledge of the law, accountability, and civic responsibility. Today's web event is brought to you by our colleagues at Street Law Incorporated. Please note that we are indeed recording today's web event. This and other web events will be archived on Intact's YouTube page, where you can find additional web webinars around juvenile justice and child victimization prevention related topics. If you would like any supporting materials for uh, this or any other webinar, please contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk and we will be more than happy to provide you with those items. Um, in regards to the materials, please note that towards the end of today's webinar, we will send a um, out the materials through WebEx here uh, so that you all have access to those materials. But please note that we'll be at the end of today's web event. If you have any issues accessing those materials at the end of the web event, please be sure to contact the OJJDP TTA uh, help desk at this email address here. Um, if you like to have the most optimal experience for today's web event, we suggest that you have the WebEx system to dial out to a phone line. When you're connected, you will see an icon that shows that you are indeed connected. That is indeed the most optimal audio for connection to have the system to dial your phone. Uh, if you experience any technical difficulties during the web event, um, it's best to log out and log back into WebEx, but if you continue to have any other issues with technical difficulties during the webinar, please send me, the host, a private chat, and I can help to troubleshoot any technical issues that you may uh, be having. Uh, please note that we uh, do encourage you all to engage in today's um, web event. With the web event, uh, when we get to our portion of question and answer, you will be able to send in your questions. Uh, we are asking that uh, you please send your questions either to everyone so that we all can see it, uh, but if that option isn't there, please note you can also send any questions to all panelists, and uh, we will be able to address as many questions as we can towards the end. You will simply uh, make sure that you select that, type your message, and then hit enter. Please help us count. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, if you're viewing in a group, meaning it's multiple folks with you right now during today's web event, please go to the chat and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. Again, if you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. When you do send your message, you can send either to everyone or send to all panelists, and we will receive that information on how many folks are joining you. Again, if you're by yourself, no need to type anything at this time. At the end of the web event, within about 24 hours, we're going to produce a uh, automated certificate that you'll receive uh, from OJJDP's Intac uh, email address, and that will be a certificate of attendance that you will receive. If you are joining in a group and would like to get access uh, to a document where we can produce a uh, certificate for those additional people that were in the room with you, please be sure to email the OJJDP TTA help desk at OJJDP TTA USDOJ.gov and we can make sure that you get what you need in order to uh, uh, get those extra certificates for the additional people that have joined you. Um, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn, well, 
yes, turn over today's web event to our colleagues with uh, Street Law. And um, Ilana, I'm going to pass it to you to do the introduction of presenters and to introduce your colleagues there. Um, Yolanda, the ball is now to you, and whenever you're ready, uh, take it away. Thanks, William. Thanks for, um, for that overview, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today for an introduction to legal life skills. We appreciate you all taking the time out to spend um, a couple of hours with us. Um, I'd like to introduce my co-presenters, my colleagues, uh, Street Law has a, a great team of, of experts who do what we do very well. Uh, the first one I'd like to introduce you to is Jasmine Donerson. Jasmine does all things access uh, for street law, so anything that you will need for street law materials, street law uh, related to street law programs, she is our gatekeeper for vendors and for publications. Next, we'll have our, um, my colleague, Jen Wheeler, who is an expert in curriculum and teacher professional development programs. Uh, Jen also has had um, a lot of experience working in Baltimore City. She's also the person on our team who helps teachers uh, master deliberative discuss discussions and to help build positive relationships across differences through deliberation. And then I am here. Um, I am Yolanda Johnson. I get to oversee our community initiatives, which covers our police and teens program, as well as the legal life skills program as to why we're here today. <clears throat> this is an introduction to legal life skills. And basically what we're doing is an awareness building session. It is a project. It is part of a project that's supported by a grant funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the Office of Justice Programs through DOJ. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that project in a few minutes. Um, during the session today, you can expect to receive an overview of street law. So for those of you who are not familiar with who street law is, uh, you'll find out a little bit about street law. Um, you'll also get an overview of legal life skills. Uh, you also, hopefully we'll walk away with a great understanding of how the legal life skills curriculum benefits young people. Um, you'll be able to participate in a lesson demo and discussion. And then towards the end, as William mentioned, you will receive a link to several documents. In those documents will be a couple of sample lessons to help you assess the value of the content and delivery methodology. I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Jen, at this point. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about who Street Law is and, and the approach that we use. Uh, street Law is a Maryland-based nonprofit. We've been around for almost 50 years, and we help others teach about law, civics, and democracy. Uh, our ultimate goal is we want to help people build the legal and civic knowledge, skills, and confidence to be positive actors of change for themselves and for others. And this slide shows our approach. So what we teach is everyday law, and by that we mean practical law, uh, helping people understand law even when they're not lawyers, um, government, civics, democracy, and human rights. How we teach is we like for it to be uh, student or participant-centered, so not lecture style, um, but where the participants are really engaging in a lot of the critical thinking work and cooperative work. Um, we like for participants to not just learn important information, but also build analytical problem solving and communication skills. And we do this through um, providing training and support for teachers, lawyers, law students, judges, law enforcement officers, community educators, and youth workers um, who use street law materials uh, in whatever program or classroom that they're, they're using them in. I think at this point. Yep. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for that overview about street law. Um, as Jen said, you know, she talked about a, a little bit about street law. We have been around for many years, and um, through those years, we've done several things. And one of those things is that we started in 1979 working through the D.C. Superior Court with young people in the juvenile justice system. 
And what happened through that program is that young people came to the court on um, Saturdays to participate in lessons like the ones you're going to hear about today. And we did that program from 1979 to 2014. Um, and also throughout the years, what we did was we worked through, um, one second, we also worked through the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention back then to develop programs for multiple populations. So for young people in the juvenile justice system, young people who are pregnant and parenting, um, also youth who are aging out of foster care. And so as we had all of those programs throughout the years, we realized that it would be great to bring all of the work that we had done throughout those years since 1979 and place them under one single adaptable curriculum, which is now legal life skills. Um, legal life skills can meet the very unique educational needs of a variety of youth and adult populations um, who are most vulnerable. Uh, those populations that are most vulnerable to things like injustices or economic disadvantages or educational inequality. Um, we go to where they are with legal life skills. We like to go to where the most vulnerable populations are. And so today, the legal life skills curriculum is being used in many classroom and, classroom and community education programs across the country. The curriculum includes 20 lesson plans offered in English and Spanish with accompanying slide decks. Um, you're going to hear a little bit more about our curriculum later. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this particular uh, webinar is being uh, conducted with support through the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Currently, Street Law is working on an expansion project with the funding support from OJJDP to expand legal life skills to youth in Maryland's juvenile justice system and gather evidence of impact. We do have evidence for these programs related to similar programs that have been done throughout the years. For example, like the program that I mentioned earlier through the D.C. Superior Court, there was an independent study done of that program that actually showed a reduce in recidivism for young people who um, for young people who actually completed a certain amount of lessons. And those studies can be found on our website. There are four main driving pillars for legal life skills. There is our practical legal education, where we want to boost participants' knowledge of the law so that they can successfully navigate daily life. Um, as Jim mentioned earlier, we believe that young people should not have to be lawyers in order to know how the law works, especially the laws that govern their lives. Um, the second pillar is essential life skills. We want young people to walk away with things like um, advocacy skills, communication skills, analytical thinking, conflict resolution skills. We want to help them through these lessons build the skills that they need in order to transition into adulthood and have stability in their lives. The third pillar is built off of community connections. Um, some of you may have brought in um, guest speakers into your classroom settings or your community education settings. And what we do through Legal Life Skills is we, co uh, we um, integrate community resource people directly into the lessons. And basically, they serve as resource experts to help you teach the lessons. They also can serve as positive role models to help young people along their path to success. The fourth pillar is boosting self-efficacy. We want young people to believe that they have agency over their own lives and also help them build the confidence in their abilities to solve problems, address challenges, and be acting contributive members of society. What are some of the benefits for teaching legal life skills or teaching law as a life skill? One of the documents that you all have in your packet is an article directly related to this, and it gives you more detail about the benefits of um, teaching law as a life skill. But here's just a, a good snapshot of the things that um, is really beneficial to teaching law as a life skill. It equips participants with practical knowledge of the laws that affect their daily lives. It assists with helping transitional age youth navigate adulthood. It also provides a space for participants to practice skills like negotiation, critical thinking, and advocacy. Our lessons are, are dynamically um, positioned to make sure that young people have a space to actually practice these skills and not just learn them. Um, again, as I mentioned, 
uh, teaching along as a life skill can provide connections to resources in communities that young people live in, as well as those role models. Teaching, they um, also build skills on handling converse, controversial topics with different viewpoints, and teaching law as a life skill helps to foster civic engagement. What are some of the audiences that legal life skills is utilized in? And this is um, this slide hopefully answers several questions that I reviewed in the, the questions that many of you submitted um, early on through your registration. Legal life skills is utilized for youth in the juvenile justice system, youth in the child welfare system. It's also used for those crossover youth. Many of you may be familiar with that term, so those youth who are impacted by multiple systems. Also youth or adults who are reentering society, LGBTQ youth groups, homeless youth and adults, students who are in alternative and regular ed settings. We're um, doing a lot more right now with teachers in, in regular classroom settings to help build awareness in that area and also to help collect some evidence in that area as well. Legal life skills is also used with girls and young women, survivors of domestic violence, and also survivors of trafficking. This slide gives you a good snapshot of many of the legal life skills sites that are happening across the country. Um, just to kind of give you a picture of some of the points of entry for young people in the juvenile justice system, we have a program in the um, Washington, D.C. area that's specifically designed for diversion, diversion programs. Um, we have a program in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where they capture youth from school and they help to also divert them from the juvenile justice system. Um, here in Maryland, Legal Life Skills is being utilized at um, Maryland Department of Juvenile Services in Prince George's County through their evening reporting center. That program also serves as a diversionary program as well as a program for youth who are on community probation, just to give you a good snapshot of that. We also have some sites that are um, that we're building out right now. Legal Life Skills is expanding quite a bit across the country. We have a program at Long Branch High School that is going to launch in a couple of weeks, and that program is specifically for students who only speak Spanish. So the volunteers will be teaching the lessons in all Spanish. Um, we have a couple of programs that we're also expanding into the Los Angeles and Bay Area and we'll also be expanding more in Atlanta and the D.C. metro area. What are some of the things that participants are saying after they complete these lessons? And we gather this through collecting surveys. Um, basically, students are saying that their knowledge of the law has increased. They say that the lessons help them to listen to other people's opinions and ideas. They also say that the lessons help them to think about ways to solve a problem. It deepened their knowledge and understanding of their rights, the understanding of contract negotiation, and it gave them the ability to develop leadership, conflict resolution, analytical thinking, and decision-making skills. So I'm going to take a little pause, and uh, I'd like to hear from you all you know, based on what you have heard so far or what you may have read on our website um, about legal life skills or street law, what national problems do you believe legal life skills can impact? And we're going to take a pause to hear from you all in the chat about that. Um, and I'll just give you an example. We believe that legal life skills is a slice of the pie in the on the whole intervention spectrum right now. So. Everything that we know that young people need and are going through, we hope that legal life skills can be a slice of that. One of the slices is increase in civic engagement. We know that across the country, there is a huge civic engagement gap, especially for young people living in underserved communities. And so through legal life skills, young people can develop those skills related to civic education and civic engagement. So if there, um, if there are any other thoughts about things that legal life skills can possibly impact, we'd like to hear from you all in the chat. I see navigating expungements on records. Thank you, absolutely. Advocacy, yes. Thank you. Youth voice, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you for that. I, hear, I see some more youth voice. 
victim-centered approach, absolutely. You, you're going to hear a little bit that, about that. School to prison pipeline, interesting. Empowers kids, reduces the degree of feelings of oppression. Love that. Parent and youth civic participation, very important. It can impact knowledge on rights when confronted by police, absolutely. My colleague Jasmine is going to share a little bit about um, our lessons um, in a few minutes. Maybe increase accountability by understanding the whys behind legal things. Very good. Wow, you all got your, your thinking caps on. Helping teach life skills to aging out of foster kids. Absolutely. Um, and thanks for bringing up the foster care youth. Um, I didn't specifically mention a couple of our sites who serve foster care youth, but this curriculum is being utilized with foster care youth in different areas of the country how to interact with law enforcement, right? To have parents present when questioned by authorities, street violence, awareness and knowledge of preventing undesired consequences. Excellent. Mm. I see things related to advocacy and advocating for themselves. What is a crime? Increasing the knowledge of human trafficking. Very good. And I just want you all to know that we will be receiving your feedback, including your chat responses from OJJD from um, Intact through this platform. And so we'll be going through that and thinking of ways that if we're not already doing some of this stuff, we may be able to incorporate it in the future. So this is great. Thank you so much. So we'll keep moving right along. And right now I am going to have Jasmine talk a little bit about the Legal Life Skills Lesson Library. Thank you all for the responses. All right, yes, thank you. And actually, Nicole um, in chat just brought up something um, that I think is going to be a great starter, and that you need to be um, a faculty member or have a certain license or certificate to teach those life skills, and you absolutely do not. Uh, you do not need to be a lawyer or have knowledge of the law in order to teach legal life skills. Uh, the curriculum is absolutely set up in a way um, that is meant for non-lawyers uh, to teach it. Um, it provides you with step-by-step -step resources and handouts and all of the um, tools that you need in order to deliver um, quality um, curriculum to your population. Um, and can someone confirm for me that the slides are moving? Yeah, awesome. Uh, so the Legal Life Skills Lesson Library uh, currently includes uh, 20 lessons on a variety of topics. Um, I've seen lots of uh, different things in the chat, um, and many of those things are covered in the Legal Life Skills Lesson Library, uh, which we'll get into more in a second. Um, it's customizable based on your audience, and it's engaging. So street law uses strategies that involve young people in the conversation to be interactive um, and thoughtful, to develop critical thinking skills as they're learning about practical legal topics. Um, and we also encourage the use of community resource people. Um, so if you are teaching a topic um, surrounding uh, dating, for example, um, or alcohol risk and liability, you can bring in a community person um, to help teach that and sort of support the lesson and also provide resources uh, to your audience. Um, and again, step-by-step -step instructions and visual aids, um, and it can be really utilized in a number of settings. Uh, in schools and classrooms, outside of schools, in the juvenile uh, justice system, foster care youth. Um, it really goes on and on. So youth and young adults can all benefit from legal life skills. Um, the lessons have also all been translated into Spanish, so you have them available in both languages, which is great. Um, and of course, you know, we're delivering so many things online now that we've also develop our handouts as fillable forms. Um, so if you're also delivering to your audience online or virtually through Zoom or WebEx or another platform, you also have those resources. 
Uh, so the Legal Life Skills Lesson Library is broken down into uh, four units. You'll also receive this one pager about the Legal Life Skills Lesson Library. Um, so you'll be able to review all of the, the lessons there and some sample lessons as well. And Yolanda will also demo one of these lessons shortly. So you'll get to see how easy it is to follow along with this curriculum. Um, so we have uh, four units, housing and employment law, financial literacy, personal and public safety, the court system, public policy, and civic engagement. Um, unit one uh, covers issues, yes, I know, it's exciting, the financial literacy part, um, negotiating and signing a residential lease. Uh, rights and responsibilities after moving into a rental property, also interviewing for a job, and rights and responsibilities in the workplace. Um, so sort of all of those uh, practical things that everyone experiences, um, getting your, your first apartment or moving into an apartment, getting a job, what your rights are in the workplace, these are all included. And each of the lessons also include um, online resources and links to things that might be applicable in your state. As we know, these are not always the same across the board. Unit two is financial literacy. So intro to credit, applying for credit, banking basics, and avoiding and resolving credit problems. Unit three is uh, a big one, it's much larger. Uh, rights and responsibilities during an arrest, use of force and deadly force, traffic stop, cost of crime, um, triggers, dating and sexual assault, child abuse and neglect. Um, and again, each of these are sort of hard topics, but they are taught in such an interactive way in our lesson plans um, that it's really easy to connect with um, young people, young adults, um, adults to um, sort of open up uh, dialogue and conversation. As we know, the law is, um, you know, fluid. Uh, unit four is the court system, public policy, and civic engagement, which includes introduction to criminal law, uh, restorative justice, intro to juvenile justice system, what does a good citizen know, believe, and do, and gun laws. Um, and again, they all include your handouts and uh, resources so that they are super easy to, to teach, and you can teach them without having any background in legal knowledge. Pass it back to Yolanda for the lesson demo so we can dig into one of these lessons. I'm actually gonna to toss it over to Jen Wheeler and I'm gonna follow her lead because I basically do what Jen and Jasmine tells me to do. I think it's the opposite, actually. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. So uh, we wanted to give you a chance to actually see some element of uh, one of our legal life skills lessons. Um, just to give you a preview prior to receiving the actual lessons and digging into them yourself. Obviously, we don't have a lot of time. Most of these lessons are 60-minute lessons. We're not going to spend 60 minutes on this. But we wanted to give you um, a, a small chunk of, of what these lessons are. So we're going to look at the Introduction to the Juvenile Justice System lesson. Uh, these are the, out, the lesson outcomes, um, which when you open up the lesson, you'll see that these outcomes are right at the top of the page. Uh, and so if you were to do the whole lesson, uh, these are the things that we'd hope you and your students will be able or your participants will be able to achieve uh, by the end. Uh, you, you can see that vocabulary is really important. Um, vocabulary is often key legal terms that uh, like I said before, we want people who are not lawyers to be able to understand the law. You have to know some law-related vocabulary in order to do that. You can see that there's uh, different outcomes related to critical thinking. So we want to tap into critical thinking by asking participants to evaluate the fairness of a juvenile's case. Um, that really allows them to think for themselves about what's fair and what's not, rather than us telling them what they should think, uh, which is an important part of uh, the street law design is uh, the how to think, not what to think uh, aspect of things. 
And then we also want to build their legal knowledge by connecting it to constitutional rights. You know, these rights come from somewhere. We want students to be or participants to be familiar with where these rights come from and how they apply to their own lives. So this is a, a short reading from the lesson. Um, and this reading is the case of Jerry Galt. So I know that some folks may not uh, be able to, to read the reading, so I'm going to go ahead and read it, um, read it aloud. But as I'm reading it, uh, I want you to think about which parts of the case would you say are fair uh, and which parts of the case would you say are unfair. When Jerry Galt was 15 years old, the police came to his door and took him into custody. He was not sure what he was in trouble for. Jerry's parents did not know what happened to him until after they came home from work. When they found out he was being held in a juvenile detention center, they rushed there to find out what happened. They were told Jerry would have a hearing the next day, but they were not told the nature of the charges against him. He could not go home before the hearing. At the hearing, they learned that their neighbor, Mrs. Cook, had told police that Jerry made an obscene phone call to her. Mrs. Cook did not show up at the hearing. Instead, a police officer testified about what Mrs. Cook had told him. Jerry blamed the call on a friend and denied making the obscene remarks. No lawyers were present and no record was made of what was said at the hearing. Jerry and his family went to another hearing six days later. Again, Mrs. Cook did not attend and no one kept an official record of what was happening at the hearing. At a third meeting with the judge, the hearing officer said that Jerry had admitted making the calls at the two previous hearings. Jerry and his family denied it, but there was no record to prove what anyone had said. The juvenile court judge found that Jerry was delinquent and ordered him sent to a juvenile detention facility until he was an adult when he turned 21 years old. An adult found guilty of the same crime would have been fined either fined $50 or sent to the county jail for no longer than 60 days. So this, again, is the case of Jerry Galt. Jerry Galt is a real person. This is a real case. Uh, this case took place in the 1960s in Arizona. You can see that some people in the chat um, recognize this case. So uh, in the chat, I'd love for folks, we're going to start maybe with the harder question here. Um, what's one aspect of this case that you think was fair. And I see uh, Carmen and, and Suzanne have, have said um, they don't think any element of this is fair. Let's let's dig in and see if we can maybe say that something in here is fair. What might be fair about what's happening? <laughs> okay, we've got that he was charged as a minor. So distinguishing the difference between a minor and adult, that he had a hearing in the first place um, was something that was fair. Yep. A, a, a speedy hearing as well. So the hearing was the next day. That's an important right. That he could appeal, that his parents were allowed at the hearing. Okay, and now let's get to the questions. So we've got some good, um, like, basics of, of the parts of the case that are fair. Let's get to the uh, the easier question. Um, what? Tell me one part of the case that's unfair and why you think it's unfair. So this adds a little layer of critical thinking. Um, what's something that's unfair and why? So I see uh, he did not get to address his accuser as one example. Why is that unfair? The disparity of the sentence between an adult and a juvenile, no, no Miranda rights were read, parents weren't present, no opportunity for cross-examination, no lawyer present, that they detained him and didn't release him to, the, to his parents, there's no record. The police testified for the accuser, arrested without knowing his charge. Yeah, so we've got we've got a lot of them. Um, <laughs> by the way, it was a phone call. There's a lot to be said here, right? There's a lot of elements of this that are unfair. Um, we, we we wanted a case where 
you'd really be able to dig into multiple elements of this and that you don't necessarily need to know the law in order to be able to identify that some of these things just don't seem fair. Um, but certainly if you at the very least watch uh, some like law and order occasionally, you know a little bit more um, to be able to say like, hey, I think he's supposed to have a lawyer um, at his at his trial. So then we want to, for some reason, can't advance the slide anymore. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so Jerry and his family have a pretty good case that his treatment was unfair. Think about a civics or government class that you took. It might have been a very long time ago or just what you know about the judicial system. If Jerry and his family felt that he was unfairly treated, what recourse of action do they have? What can they do? Because in the United States, we have a justice system where they can do something. So what can they do? Yeah, so Jerry and his family are going to appeal, and they're going to appeal this case to the Supreme Court. When the case gets to the Supreme Court, the arguments that they're going to hear are about whether Jerry has certain rights. They're not going to be about the facts of the case anymore. They're going to be about, does Jerry as a juvenile have certain rights? And so this case went to the Supreme Court. Um, it was decided in 1967. Uh, Supreme Court ruled 8 to 1 in favor of Jerry, and they said that this clause of the 14th Amendment, which is known as the Due Process Clause, applies to juveniles. Previously, this clause only applied to adults, um, and, and so it took until 1967 for uh, the court to say, okay, yeah, let's make this apply to juveniles as well. And to get a little bit deeper into that, what does it mean that that, uh, that clause is applied to juveniles? Well, that means that the court ordered that these due process rights, um, the juveniles have these due process rights. So the right to notice of charges. Um, I saw people in the chat say that that was something that was unfair. If you're going to be able to prepare for a case, you got to know what you're charged with. Uh, the right to counsel, that you have a right to have someone who knows the law represent you. And that if you can't pay for counsel, that if you can't pay for a lawyer, there's a, a court-appointed lawyer. The right to confront and cross-examine witnesses. So people mentioned that the, the, the police officer spoke uh, for the accuser, um, but really she should have been there on the stand um, to to be able to share what happened to her and so that Jerry's lawyers could cross-examine her as well. And then finally, the privilege against self-incrimination, that they have the right to remain silent. Somebody said the Miranda warning. Um, that's, that's kind of where that comes from. And that's the, the um, part of the case that we're going to, or the part of the lesson that we're going to kind of end with today. You can see that that was kind of short and we could have really extended it out a lot to have com a deeper conversation about um, the, the fairness and unfairness of Jerry's case, but these lessons are also pretty adaptable. So we want you to be able to spend the amount of time that you think is important for your um, participants when you do that. And this is what the lesson will look like when you get it. Um, You'll notice when you get these lessons that there are suggestions and signals to help a community resource person join your lesson. So in this lesson, for example, you might want to bring in an attorney who specializes in juvenile cases to support the lesson. And if you gave that community resource person, that, that attorney, the lesson, you handed them the lesson file, they'd actually see suggestions in the lesson of questions that they should prepare to answer. Um, so in this case, uh, state by state, there are different juvenile justice procedures and, and laws, and so you want to have uh, an attorney who can speak to that. Um, for example, what are the procedures for juvenile hearings, or uh, do juveniles ha in your state have the right to a jury trial? Those are, are things that, that we can't put in these lessons because we don't develop them for a particular state, but having a community resource person can really um, help with that. So I think with that, um, we are going to move into the Q&A, if that's right. Okay. 
I think that at this point, what we like to do is maybe is give before we go directly into Q and A is give Jasmine a chance to talk a little bit about our resources and accessing street law things online. Um, and then we'll move right into Q and A. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in addition to uh, legal life skills, there are many other resources available uh, from Street Law on our website. Um, and I am going to pull that up for you now. So our primary website, um, and I believe our colleague Ben has dropped this in the chat a few times, um, is streetlaw.org. Um, however, there is also store.streetlaw.org which is where you'll find a lot of our curriculum and other resources. And so there are resources here for, for educators, uh, legal professionals, community-based organizations, uh, government agencies, uh, social service agencies. Um, so you can learn more about us and what we do um, on our homepage, but under resources, you'll come to store.streetlaw.org and you will find a wealth of materials ranging from deliberations and mock trials to lesson plans, um, strategy videos, and um, the street law textbook, amongst other things. Um, and so here you'll find uh, products um, here that you can add to your cart and many of these, uh, well, most of these resources are completely free. Um, and so the, the site requires that you add them to your cart in order to download the files. Um, and so there are case summaries and other resources here. You can find uh, materials on SCOTUS, um, Constitution, deliberation materials, uh, we have a resource bundle with video here and individual lessons uh, related to a number of topics, mock trials, a variety of lesson plans, uh, anatomy of a case, applying precedent, strategies. There are also uh, videos to accompany and then under textbooks, you'll find our three textbooks. And under publications, you will find legal life skills as well as police and teens. Um, I would say that they are sort of both under the same umbrella. They actually share some of the same um, content. Um, however, police and teens is designed to be um, utilized to build relationships between um, police officers um, in the community and um, with youth. And so there's a number of cross-ranging um, lessons in these two areas. Um, and I will drop the link to uh, the site in the chat if it hasn't already been there. Um, and if you ever have any questions about uh, street law resources, please do feel free to reach out to us. Jasmine, that was great. Thank you. There was a lot of great positive responses um, about our site and resources. And so again, please feel free to reach out to us. I believe our colleague is going to also drop our general emails in the chat. Um, but we'd like to take some time to do some Q&A. Um, we did review all of your questions. Uh, we may not be able to get to all of them today, but what I tried to do was compile them into uh, ones who were very si similar. And I'll just start with um, one question that was um, related to recidivism in data and evidence base. That is exactly what we're looking to do through this project and through multiple projects that we have going on right now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you go to Street Law's site, and one of my colleagues can provide a link to that in the chat um, uh, before we finish. But if you go to Street Law's site, there is some data related to our programming. There's data related to the program that we did through the D.C. Superior Court 
um, several years back, and that's the one that um, showed the positivity through um, in a reduction in recidivism rates. Um, so just take a look at that. But through this project, we are able to provide training to juvenile justice educators here in the state of Maryland, as well as training to school resource officers. And so our goal is to really um, determine how this can be a promise in practice to spread more across the country, but to also really gather some data to figure out how is it working in our different communities, in our different populations. And here in the state of Maryland, we'll be able to determine that through the juvenile justice um, education system. Um, the other question that I'll address before I um, do some Q&A with, with my colleagues is um, training and funding. Um, there were some questions related to, is there funding for this? While street law doesn't provide funding for this, we're always looking for folks to partner with to search for funding opportunities. So again, reach out to us and let us know if your organization or government entity is interested and we'd love to dialogue with you about that. Um, also, there was um, questions about related to training. Street law does uh, training. That is something that we pride ourselves on to make sure that we can do um, the best job possible to help our programs be delivered in a high rate of fidelity. Um, right now, there may be some upcoming opportunities that we offer for legal life skills to different groups. Um, so keep following our website and reaching out to us as well. Um, but if you're interested in things at your site, at your facility, at your school, um, please contact us and we'll be able to dialogue about that. Um, a couple of questions in that really jumped out at me that I thought were, were really useful that also came up in the chat today, having to do with can legal life skills be utilized for parent and community groups? And I'm gonna toss that question to Jasmine. Um, and, and just hear her response about that. I think that she'd be really excited to talk about that. I'm sorry, do you want to repeat that question for me? Sure. Can the legal life skills lessons be utilized in uh, parent and community groups? Absolutely. Um, I think that's sort of the beauty of legal life skills is that it can be implemented in a number of um, settings and from participants, um, particularly um, our Spanish speaking participants, we often find, or I've heard from them directly, that um, they've learned something and went back to a parent and said, Hey, mom, did you know, you know, our landlord's not allowed to do this? And here's a site we can go to to um, get help or ask a question to the legal team in the county or whatever the case may be. And so I believe that it's super beneficial to implement it both to parents and uh, youth and young adults. Um, that's absolutely a way to implement legal life skills. Thank you, Jasmine. That's excellent. Yeah, we love to call it multi-generational. It's a multi-generational yeah. curriculum. Um, and as I said earlier there, it's being utilized in youth settings, but also with adult settings, um, with, with adults who have been um, survivors, who are survivors of, of trafficking or survivors of domestic violence as well. A um, couple of other questions that uh, came up quite often. Um, one related to can util legal life skills be utilized to build a framework for teaching high school students um, in a summer session or even throughout the school year. Um, Jen, can you speak a little bit to this? Sure, so Jasmine mentioned that there are uh, 24 lessons and four units, 20 lessons and four units in the uh, Legal Life Skills uh, lesson set. They're all, um, they can be taught as standalone lessons. You can mix them up. You can um, teach them one after the other. Uh, you can extend them in different ways. Um, so we have some some teachers who are currently uh, bringing legal life skills into their classes, and, and they're doing it in a couple different ways. Some teachers are doing it exactly like that. They're teaching a legal life skills class, and so they're just teaching the lessons. Um, and then we have some teachers who are integrating the lessons into an existing class, so a government class or a civics class where they're saying, hey, this 
lesson fits in with um, you know this amendment to the Constitution that we're going to talk about today. So there's a bunch of different ways to do it. We wanted these lessons to be really adaptable to you. Um, I hope that helps. Absolutely. Um, Jen, you touched on a, a few things that they're adaptable in different environments, they're adaptable with different um, students, and they can be utilized um, it, to be integrated in the classroom. So, yeah, I think that touches on a few of the questions that folks had. Um, and we're always working on things. We're always looking for new opportunities to help folks teach our lessons better, especially as ch things change um, in the external space. Uh, we love to implement legal life skills in every state across the country. I saw that in the chat, absolutely. Um, another question or thought that came up through the, um, the registration and also in the chat is related to racial bias and equity. Um, that is something that street law is working on even more now. I will tell you that one of the things that I know is being worked on is incorporating lived experiences into our lessons. Um, so that's really important. Um, one of the questions talked about, like, what if these things come up while you're teaching the lessons? Um, I will tell you that they will come up. We want them to come up. We want young people to talk about the things that they are facing every day. Um, we want them to talk about um, through the scenarios, well, this is what the law says, but this is what I saw happening. And so through that, they it, it ignites um, discussion about things that are happening right now and what's relevant to the law, um, utilizing some relevant topics or relevant incidents to really incorporate into our lessons. Um, the other question related to this was about how do you motivate young people to learn in these spaces? Um, I've had the opportunity to observe many, many legal life skill sessions, and I'll tell you one of the things that um, really helps with getting them encouraged and motivate, motivated to participate is talking about things that are relevant to them. And so in our trainings, we also, you know, we help people, our volunteers or our teachers, um, really understand how to incorporate relevant topics. Um, our lessons already have a lot of relevant topics in them, but that is a way to really start that um, conversation with young people is to make sure that the lessons are always relevant to their lives and that they can relate to things that are going on. Um, if you're teaching a lesson related to, uh, I don't know, banking basics or credit, it would be great to bring in maybe something from the outside to see for them to talk about something through music that, um, that they're familiar with or an actual um, a current case. That's really important as well. Um, the other questions that uh, popped out at me were about um, local laws and expert reviews, like legal expert reviews. We, um, when street law lessons are developed, when legal less, life skill lessons are developed, they go through several channels of writing and reviewing. One of that, um, one of those reviews is related to legal experts in and outside of outside of street law. We have um, consultants that we work with. We have expert reviewers. We have friends of street law um, who will review our lessons. Um, we're also looking at ways to have them continuously reviewed, um, but we also like to hear from the field. A lot of times we update lessons or um, we understand that maybe we need to change a little bit of our content based, based on what we get from the field. So we'd love to hear from all of you as you review the sample lessons just to see how they feel, review the content, um, and see if it's something that you can incorporate and want to have a, a further conversation about in your area. As far as the local laws, as Jen said earlier, um, we do not write our lessons on a local state-by-state state or county-by-county county basis. The lessons are pretty much written on a general national umbrella. But at the end of each or most of the lessons, what we do have is we have a mechanism to help folks who are teaching the lessons take the time to look up their local laws, to look up their state laws, what is really happening in that area. Um, for example, I just observed a session in Atlanta where they were teaching a lesson, um, the legal life skills lessons on traffic stops. And in that lesson, you know, some of the people who were engaged and the participants talked about, well, this happened to me, or if this happened to me, what should I do? 
um, and what, what resources do I have? And so the volunteers were prepared to give them the breakdown of what they could do in, I believe it was Cobb County, um, to go and file complaints and follow up on something that was happening with them. Um, so yeah, we ask that you definitely take the time in the review and preparation process to bring in and incorporate local laws. General Jasmine, any questions in the chat that popped out at you that we may be able to touch on? There's a lot here. I think there, there is a lot. I think we have been <laughs> trying to sort of answer them as they, they've come in um, as fast as we could. Um, yeah. 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 I see something about slides or the PDF of the presentation. Yes, you will receive the link from INTAC at the end. Um, you will receive the link to the slide deck as well as sample lessons, as, and um, you'll also receive two handouts. One handout will be the Legal Life Skills Lesson Library and an overview of Legal Life Skills, and then the other handout will be about teaching law as a skill. A couple of questions about critical thinking all embedded throughout all of our lessons. We, um, it actually provokes young people to think differently and to think critically. Um, so we, we pride ourselves on our lessons being highly engaging. Let's see. You guys have some great thoughts here. Another question about can this uh, be brought to all states? You know, um, we, you know, I mentioned a few programs earlier that where legal life skills is being utilized, but we also have people who have been using street law for many years and who may um, may be familiar with the content and they may purchase the lessons and still integrate it. Um, and so we may not work directly with them, but they may purchase our lessons and um, deliver the lessons in that form. But we really do um, recommend that you contact us to help discuss training um, before you implement the lessons. Fabulous resources. Um, I hope we got to a lot of your questions. There's um, going to be, you know, an opportunity for you all to reach out to us through that street law email. I see that my colleague has also uh, shared our emails. The, our emails are also up on the slide. Our lessons, yep, lessons are reviewed by legal experts. Excellent, excellent. Um, lessons are all written on an hour for legal life skills. As Jen said earlier, the lessons are adaptable. Um, so if you're teaching in a classroom setting, you may not have an hour. Um, so you may have to split the lesson in two, um, in a part one and part two, and to teach through two different um, classroom subjects. Uh, one of the things that I didn't touch on that was in the, um, in the pre less in the pre questions is pivoting to virtual. Um, I'm sure you all have had to do it, and street law has had to do it over the past year. We really had to figure out a way of how to help our sites pivot to virtual. Um, many of those sites that I mentioned earlier are actually implementing legal life skills online right now. We help them do that. Um, Jasmine also spoke about having the handouts for students that they can access online and they're fillable in an online space. Because Legal Life Skills works with so many different diverse audiences, we do um, allow the modifications on a case-by-case -case basis, so based off of what environment they're teaching in. The lessons may already be in a great format to be taught online, um, and the lessons also come with some guiding slide decks as well to help our, P our volunteers teach online. Um, but we'd like for it to be done based off of the needs of the audience and the site. Yolanda, um, when you talk about challenges. age, I think we're, um, there was sure. a question about the age appropriateness. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, legal life skills is predominantly utilized in that um, higher age range of middle school into high school and young adulthood, so um, more so like that 14 to 24. Um, we have seen the lessons utilized in younger spaces. Um, I do suggest uh, asking about adaptations in younger spaces, especially with some of the content, 
I have seen as young as 12 to 13, especially in some of our foster care sites, but it normally, um, that, that sweet spot is normally from 14 to 24, which is also consistent with um, opportunity youth and those youth who are um, disadvantaged. Thanks for that, Jasmine. Um, there are some challenges with delivering any of our lessons virtually. Um, absolutely. Uh, right now, because we go to where um, young people who are most vulnerable are, some of those young people do not have access. They may not even have a laptop, or they may have multiple family members at home using the same Wi-Fi or utilizing the same computer. Some of our partners, especially our corporate partners, help to ensure that they do have um, access or they're working in um, through foster care sites or juvenile justice sites to help them with getting uh, different access to the lessons. Um, there's been a lot of challenge, of course, with uh, pivoting to virtual, but at the same time, there's been so many successes, um, especially if the volunteers are engaging, because as you can imagine, uh, someone mentioned Zoom. Um, I, I think there were a few questions in the pre-questions about Zoom, um, but as you can imagine, kids are Zoomed out, as you may be at times too, right? And so if you're gonna come on the screen and engage with them, you have to be engaged and make it relevant to them. Um, I have found that it is really good to have a few people online uh, communicating and teaching the lessons and then also uh, folks who can engage with young people in chat because they may be more comfortable engaging in chat. Let's see. <clears throat> then you want to talk a little bit about our teacher professional development area of street laws work. I did see some folks who were from um, school districts, you know, in the in the pre questions. Sure. Um, so street law. Part of what street law does is we work with teachers in uh, who typically teach secondary, sixth through twelfth grade. Um, and we provide uh, customized, usually, professional development training. Um, we also have some uh, free online information sessions uh, that we do occasionally as well. Um, our, we cover a lot of different things uh, during that time, but I'd say that most of what we do uh, speaks to teachers who teach a law elective course or a government or civics course. And you'll see if you go to store.streetlaw.org, you'll see a lot of the resources there um, are resources that you could see being used in a government or law-related course. Thank you, Jen. Any other questions, feel free to type in chat. I'm just pushing through here to see if there's anything else that comes up. Hmm. Uh, I see there's a comment in a couple of comments I saw about Baltimore County. Um, we do work with Baltimore County Schools through some teacher professional development. We also work with Baltimore County Schools through their SRO, School Resource Officer Program. Um, I do see a mention of the JOINS Program, and I believe that we may have someone who works in that program. So be good to hear a little bit more about that as well. See, we have folks on from uh, West Virginia, um, also some tribal communities. Street Law doesn't have work specifically for tribal communities at, that, at this time, but if you want us to reach out to us and just kind of give us um, some feedback about the needs of uh, young people in these tribal communities, please let us know as we begin to expand and look at other ways that we can reach different um, populations across the country. <clears throat> INSAC has provided a link to a survey in the chat, um, and I believe they're going to provide it again. Uh, please fill out this survey. We will review them and figure out like a way that um, we can incorporate some of your suggestions into our work or look at it through, um, look at things through a different lens um, and reach out directly to us if you have direct questions about trainings, about funding opportunities or partnership opportunities, um, or just anything that we share today. And with that, William, I'm going to pass the ball back to you. All right. 
thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> just a couple of items before we uh, conclude today. Um, just want to let our audience know that we do indeed have the files that we've shared. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go in and actually share some of these files for today in a uh, um, share file uh, function here in uh, WebEx. So I'm sharing the items, and so for those who may have any issues, any problems uh, accessing or getting the files on that link there, uh, please note that I am indeed uh, sending out those items uh, here so that you all can uh, you know, get access to them. So quite a few of them here, so bear with me while I click through here and uh, make sure that I'm sharing these files with folks just to make sure that you guys have them. Again, we did share them uh, through a link that you all should have uh, also received um, that my colleague Joyce um, has put in the chat for you all to click on. So between this file sharing application, that link that was provided there, you all should have the handouts that we have associated with today's uh, web event. So I'll give folks just a few minutes just to go ahead and get access to that. Um, the other thing that I want to do is go over these last few slides here just to kind of wrap us up uh, for housekeeping purposes. If you're interested in uh, reaching out to OJJDP's Intech, here is the information where you can access um, all of our information uh, with Intech. We encourage you to please uh, be sure to uh, text Intech at 22828 if you want to sign up for our listserv. You can also check us out on Facebook as well. And uh, Facebook is at OJJDP TTA. If you would like information about uh, OJJDP's TTA Help Desk, uh, you can reach out to uh, them at the number here and also at the email address that's listed here. If you're interested in uh, learning more about OJJDP overall, we encourage you to please visit OJJDP's website um, at the URL that's uh, displayed on this slide. Uh, also, sign up for OJJDP's uh, Juve Just listserv as well, where you can learn more about um, upcoming events uh, that OJJDP has to offer. Do you have a training or technical assistance need? Well, if so, please submit a request via the uh, help, a TTA 360 platform. You can go to this URL here where you can submit a TTA uh, need if you would like. Uh, as I mentioned before in the beginning of the uh, web event, please note that we will archive uh, webinars of the YouTube page, uh, you can also access other webinars that include uh, juvenile justice and child victimization prevention related topics. If you would like to get any supporting materials uh, related to in this or any of those other webinars, you can contact the TTA Help Desk and we'd be more than happy to make sure that you get those um, items. Uh, please note that we do have a few upcoming events uh, that we would love for you all to attend if interested, including a grant solicitation webinar where they will uh, cover the uh, grant solicitation mentoring for youth affected by the opioid crisis and drug addiction. We also have a uh, web event with our colleagues with the National District Attorneys Association, uh, Social Media 101 for Prosecutors, Part 2. Those two events are available for registration. Also note that we have um, events with our uh, colleagues with the Innocent Justice Foundation that are, are available for you all to register for and attend. And the final, final thing I'll do here is I'm going to go ahead and open up one last uh, poll question for our audience to uh, provide information. And basically, uh, we, what we want to know is how do you plan to apply the um, information that you learned during today's web event? Um, the poll is open now. Uh, please note that this particular poll question is multiple select, meaning you can go in and actually select multiple options here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave that up for just a few minutes while everyone files out into the virtual room. But with that being said, thank you all very much for attending today's uh, webinar. Um, I will bid you all a great afternoon. Thank you very much for joining. William, I'd like and, to just say a little bit about oh. the handouts.
that oh, yes, uh, they're going to receive again. Yeah, just to reiterate, you will receive a handout that gives you an overview of legal life skills in the lesson library, as well as the handout related to teaching law as a life skill. The other um, sample handouts that you're going to get are sample lessons, and they are to be utilized for you to review, get back to us, think about the curriculum. Um, one of the lessons is Banking Basics. That lesson gets into the things that you and I may have learned about at our kitchen table or through our parents, but most of our young people have not learned, and we don't take that for granted. It's a very simplistic approach to helping them understand banking. Um, you'll also receive the Intro to Juvenile Justice lesson, which Jen did such an amazing job today, just giving you a snapshot of that lesson. Um, you're going to receive the lesson called True Cost Courts of Crime. Uh, that, that lesson helps young people to really explore how their um, crime or crimes in their community may have an impact on themselves or their community and their victims. Um, the other lesson, the last lesson, has to do with triggers. That lesson is specifically positioned in our Unit 3 that has to do with law enforcement interactions as well as healthy relationships like dating and sexual assault. Triggers help young people to really understand how the things that they do may affect other people and how the things that other people do may affect them as well. And so it's an excellent lesson to get young people thinking about how their actions may affect someone else and vice versa uh, through verbal and nonverbal ways. So just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what you're going to get. And thank you all for joining us today. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much, Yolanda. <laughs> and uh, everyone have a wonderful uh, afternoon.